Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The cookies are all gone, so we can uh, <laughs> get into the official part of the event. It's my great pleasure as uh, president of Friends of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to call this uh, event to order. As you know, we're hosting um, Dr. Victor Zhao, who will be introduced uh, more formally by my colleague Bruce McManus. Now, Bruce, of course, is very much part of all the organizational efforts. He's vice president of Friends of CIHR, so uh, we spare, we share uh, all the accolades and, and the others uh, as well. But the, the most important thing uh, today is to let you know that the Friends of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research is dedicated to the goals and ideals of CIHR, which is under great duress because funding is so bad, but the goals and ideals remain very vital and important. We're also committed to share and promote uh, science and knowledge in society so that the community is more literate. And as well, we're very interested in the next generation and future uh, scientists in the community as we seek to renew our knowledge generating <coughs> structures and the creative uh, forces of science, knowledge, and society. Part of the activities of Friends uh, of CHR includes the um, uh, very interesting, very um, um, attractive features of providing a special award to people of high achievement, that is the Friesen International Prize in Health Research, which was established in the name of an iconic figure that everybody uh, I'm sure will be familiar with, and that is Henry Friesen, who contributed so much to science, discovered prolactin, which helped immensely women around the world, and also is credited with the establishment of the uh, CIHR some uh, 12 years ago, approximately. Um, and the um, award committee selects individuals in, in his image. And this year, we're uh, highly honored, of course, that Dr. Zhao accepted the Friesen International Prize because he uh, epitomizes uh, Dr. Friesen's great achievements, his strengths, uh, his, his vision, and in addition to that, uh, adds to it, as all previous Friesen Prize winners have, a perspective that is uh, beyond our own boundaries, that is international, global, and visionary. Now, we can't credit the uh, recent sunshine to uh, Dr. Zhao, <laughs> we'd like to, but as I said in earlier line, he does bring light to any community that he uh, engages, and this is, uh, of course, no uh, exception. And so I'm very pleased to call the event to order and uh, I'll let you know that there are a couple of things that you might pick up at the end if you'd like, and that is a book on previous Friesen Prize winners' essays, very interesting reading, uh, and also an application form if you'd like to join Friends of CIHR. And for any trainee who registers today, the first year's dues are waived. So uh, <laughs> in addition to cookies, you get this as a reward. <laughs> but I'd like to now invite my colleague and friend Bruce McManus to come and introduce Dr. Zhao appropriately. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Abby. And, uh, and thanks, uh, thanks, everyone, for, uh, for being here. Uh, today, everyone in the room is in for a, a, a huge treat. Um, we, we've had the luxury of having Victor uh, with us since last evening, and, and although he's having some emotional difficulties getting over the Patriots' loss, <laughs> uh, uh, given, given the number of years he, he spent in, in Boston, we, we tried to, uh, to solve that with a little wine last night, and and uh, we had a great discussion at the leaders' breakfast this morning uh, downtown, uh, which he led on the future of, uh, of academic medicine, which uh, everyone would, would really uh, have enjoyed. Uh, so uh, it's my pleasure, uh, as Avi has, um, has indicated, to, uh, to, to introduce Victor in a, in a formal way, uh, briefly. Uh, you have a program uh, with you. Uh, if you came through the front door. Uh, and in that program, as Abi alluded to, the, since 2005, there's been uh, sensational individuals who have been awarded the prize in, in honor of Henry Friesen and, and the legacy that he's left uh, all of us, even though he's not done yet. 
um, in, in creating that legacy. And uh, a man, a man who's touched many people directly in this room. Uh, and I was, it was interesting uh, hearing just before we started the session that uh, how close uh, uh, Zhao and 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 Angel and and Pere and and Hog and and all of these people are in different ways uh, inter intersected along uh, the path of uh, of their careers. So it's really wonderful. Uh, to uh, to have you here, Victor, and and on behalf of uh, all of my colleagues and friends in, in this uh, room, uh, introduce uh, you and, and this uh, particular forum uh, on uh, regeneration and the heart. Uh, the uh, the importance of recognizing uh, Henry Friesen uh, cannot be overstated, and although he cannot be here with us today, um, certainly. Uh, we feel his vision in uh, seeing Dr. Zhao. We have uh, a number of people I would like to just briefly recognize, especially uh, Dr. Yvonne Lefebvre, who is the president of the PHC, uh, Providence Healthcare Research Institute, and, uh, and, and Dr. Sam Lichtenstein, the head of uh, cardiac surgery, and a number of other individuals here in the room who are leaders in our midst as well. So on behalf of the, the Friends of CHR and, and also in association with the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, which is a major supporter of this, of this prize, uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce somebody that I had the good fortune of meeting uh, many years ago in the late 70s uh, training in Boston, where Victor will tell you he tried to teach me something, but uh, something some people are un unteachable. Uh, but but we did uh, we did actually have uh, great times in in, in uh, training in uh, clinical medicine in in, uh, in Boston and it was it was on the basis of that early experience that I, I got to see uh, a man who was uh, going to be a little bit uh, more and a little bit different than than uh, many of my colleagues and certainly myself. And uh, it, was, it was through that good fortune and that, that, following uh, Victor that when the CIHR that Henry Friesen created uh, was inaugurated in uh, 2000, uh, one of the first people on my list for the Institute Advisory Board was uh, Victor Zhao. And despite all of his busyness, uh, he, uh, he agreed and he came to Vancouver when it wasn't sunny and uh, sat in a February, uh, February day of, of 2001 uh, upstairs in the villa at St. Paul's Hospital for our first IAB meeting. So um, he, he gave much then, and he subsequently was on the international review panel uh, in this cycle of the review of CHR. So he's always given back to the Canadian system that, that uh, was his beginning. So... Beyond what you know, that uh, as it says on the uh, the uh, slide that you see, uh, uh, beyond the fact that uh, Victor is the uh, president and uh, CEO of the Duke University Health System and Chancellor of Health, health Affairs at Duke University, uh, he, he's the James B. Duke Professor of Medicine and the Director of Molecular and Genomic Vascular Biology at Duke. Um, he, uh, before that time, uh, one of my uh, great uh, mentors was Eugene Braunwald, still is, and uh, as the professor of medicine and physics at, at Harvard at the Brigham, uh, Victor would follow him uh, there in the, in the late 90s uh, when, when Eugene stepped down. Before that time, he, he held uh, endowed uh, positions at Stanford University, both in medicine and uh, and cardiology, and has made just enormous contributions in, uh, in basic science of vascular disease and, and vascular homeostasis, uh, but also in terms of the development of concepts related to global health and uh, health inequities uh, that he'll talk about this afternoon at 4 o'clock at, at UBC. He is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies of Science, Academy of Sciences in the U.S. and also the European Academy of uh, Sciences and Arts. Uh, he was the chairman of the NIH uh, Cardiovascular Disease Advisory Committee 
and served on the advisory committee to uh, the director of the NIH, uh, Elias Zerhouni. Um, he also uh, has served on uh, numerous uh, private sector um, boards uh, and reflects the, the reach uh, that he has in concept from, uh, from academic medicine to uh, development of therapeutics and, uh, and then, as I've mentioned, global health. He has uh, been prolific in, in his roles, uh, has co-authored 10 books uh, and some 400 or so uh, peer-reviewed articles, and especially has made contributions uh, that he's, he's known uh, for in many uh, arenas related to the ren renin-angiotensin system and really laid the, the groundwork for the development of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, uh, which of course are very effective therapeutics. Uh, he also has, uh, he pioneered gene therapy uh, concepts and experiments for vascular disease, uh, including the, the development of the first uh, DNA decoy molecules to block transcription. And uh, he, he, he's continued to work in this arena despite all of his other responsibilities. And I think today he'll share with us uh, some ideas uh, about how gene therapy and cell therapy uh, can be knit together perhaps as, as, uh, uh, as an approach to go forward uh, when each one in its own right is challenging and has, uh, has its own uh, limitations. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to say that um, this uh, distinguished uh, gentleman, scholar, um, is, is, uh, is uh, the perfect representation of what Henry Friesen Prize was created for. And uh, I welcome you uh, to the podium, and, and I know you'll join me in, in welcoming Victor here. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, that was, is this on? Uh, that was a little painful. And uh, I think it's taken about 15 minutes of my talk. So <laughs> if I retain you a bit longer, you know why. <clears throat> uh, first of all, it's just great to see so many young people in this audience, but also people like Jim Hogg and uh, Yvonne Lefebvre and because Peter Perry. Peter came right up to me and said, I was a student. And that was that long ago. So it goes to show six degrees of separation. <laughs> no, not that long ago. And uh, Aubie, of course, uh, been terrific for organizing this thing, the Friends of uh, CIHR. And Sam, thank you for being here as well. So for me, it's just a great honor to be the Friesen Prize winner and to have this chance to tell you about some of my work and other people's work. But before I start, I'll just tell you that... Uh, for me, it's been a really interesting journey because as I look at Henry Friesen and what he represents, uh, innovator, uh, leader, educator, uh, scientist, physician, you know, I think as I said this morning, in one lifetime, he's done about five different lifetimes for most people. And as a young man, when I was at McGill, uh, certainly I aspired to be like Henry and many of my other mentors. And I owe... Canada, a great uh, debt of gratitude because uh, many of you know I grew up in Hong Kong and came over here for my first journey to study and had it not for all the mentorship and the support I got, uh, I won't be here standing in front of you today. I also have an interesting career because I start off like a physician scientist, but now of course I have the opportunity of being a leader as well, and I want to combine both of these things. And some people say, well, how do you do all this stuff? I think at the end of the day, it is actually people who surround, you surround yourself with and how good they are, particularly young people, and how you organize your time and prioritize that enable me to continue face the challenges that so many uh, that we have ahead of us. So this topic I chose today, I thought may be interesting because I still do research in this area, but also um, Albi and uh, Bruce said, make a clinically relevant topic and make it clinically relevant. So I thought what I'm going to do is try to achieve a balance in my talk about why I do this and what does it mean potentially to our patients. And, uh, and then, of course, 
make sure I go through some of the signs with you. But so if you forgive me if I can go through in great depth many of the things I'm going to talk about. Now, I thought, you know, in the tradition of great Canadian institution, I should start with the clinical case. So here it is. 55-year-old uh, female experienced chest pain. She first, like most people say, it was indigestion. And I waited. She waited for a while. And two hours later, she really said, this doesn't feel right. So she called the EMS. It was brought to a nearby hospital in the community. And right away, they recognized that she had, uh, she's having an acute MI. Uh, a heart attack, and uh, so she was airlifted to St. Paul's Hospital. Immediately when she came to the hospital, the cath lab was ready for her, so within 60 minutes, which is pretty good data now, that she had her primary lesion, which is a 100% occlusion of left anterior descending artery and 90% of LCA, both uh, angioplasty and stented. So, the problem is that if you look at the time she's taken to decide to call the EMS, the time to go to an emergency room, the time to airlift it over here, and time you eventually have this done was six and a half hours later. Now, this turns out to be a very important issue because, as you know, in ischemic injury, uh, whether it's brain or heart or elsewhere, there's a critical time window where if you reperfuse and restore oxygenation and blood flow, you would have salvaged that tissue. However, if you go beyond a certain period, the tissue might have, in, have undergone irre, irreversible damage and, and cells undergoing apoptosis, whereby it's insufficient if one were to able to even reperfuse. And that's what the case with her is, which is just at the border, about four to six hours of that window of time to be reperfused. So as the discharge, she did have a big MI, and her echo shows that she had a depressed ejection fraction, but she had no evidence of heart failure. So it's given all the medication that we now know. And uh, three years later, she, however, did quite well, but then she developed progressive heart failure. So this case illustrates a number of issues. One is there is a narrow window of time for uh, intervention. And that window of time, which now increasingly is getting you know, people are able to shorten that intervention time through airlifting, through thrombolytic therapy, through angioplasty and others for revascularization. But still, many of the people, if you really re look at the data, fall outside that window of safety. Second is that once you have the massive injury, it shows that patients do not have, or human beings do not have really sufficient endogenous repair regeneration mechanism so that over time, that they undergo cardiac dilatation, eventually go into heart failure. So my research has always been thinking about how I can learn from the clinical bedside and use the information and the fundamental biologic research to have an impact and perhaps uh, you know, make a difference. So on the first issue, uh, one thinks about what are the fundamental uh, ways in which we can make a difference. This is data from a trial called GUSTU-2B, demonstrated that the mortality of, uh, from acute MI is in 30 days highly depend on how fast you revascularize them. So you can see the door to balloon time, which is a surrogate to measure when you reach the ED to when the balloon is inflated to reestablish flow. But obviously, as I pointed out, actually it's not just the door to balloon time. It is in fact ischemia to balloon time that really is the important issue. But nevertheless, you can see for those who did not have primary in, uh, intervention, mortality rate is about as high as 10%, and this highly depends on how soon you reestablish uh, reperfusion. The problem is that if you look at how we treat patients every day or the real, real world, when you go from symptom recognition to being all the way to coming to the hospital, there's delay. But also, there's not a systematic way by which people uh, arrive at reperfusion approach. It could be that you get directly taken to the cat lab for PCI. It could be that you get lytic therapy uh, you know, in the ambulance or in the ED and then to a cat lab. Or it could be that you end up in the emergency room, then you're taken to a cat lab. And every one of the steps are subject to potential delays. So critically, uh, clearly, this is insufficient, what we do today. And part of a question that my, uh, my colleagues and I ask is, like, can we actually address 
this issue altogether. Aside from the logistic issue, there may be biological opportunities to make a difference. So the therapeutic strategy we start off is thinking about uh, first, acute treatments are limited by timeliness of administration. In other words, there's plenty, a plenty of it, biologics and drugs that are given when they're given in a controlled fashion can show you can reduce the amount of ischemic injury. But the problem is the timeliness of, a, of giving the drug. When patients at home, you can give this. And until you reach the, in the ambulance, that's the first opportunity to give the drug. And usually, the time delay is too much. So we figure maybe an ideal approach is to administer a therapeutic agent in a preemptive manner. That is, before the patient needs it. Now, you can say, well, that's prevention, right? But actually, as I'll show you, what we like to do is to preemptively treat the patient with gene therapy, high-risk patients, so that the time when the patient needs the gene product the gene is turned on by ischemia and protect the myocardium. So, so the idea of preventing future episodes of ischemia with this approach. So a few years ago, uh, we've been working on gene therapy, and now the good news, of course, the vectors are getting so much better, and including AAV vectors and antivirus can give you stable integration of your transgene so that you actually have an opportunity to say, which of the gene product do we use, want to use, to protect the ischemic myocardium or the ischemic tissue. And I've only shown you a few examples of this. Our work is mainly focused on actually all these three. I'm going to tell you about hemoxygenase 1. And then you can deliver this intramyocardial or coronary. So what is the uniqueness of this approach? Well, first of all, is it would be great to be able to administer the therapeutic gene using a vector that can give you stable integration, but give it to the patient or the high-risk subject before they need it. But using a regula regulated expression whereby the gene is silent when you give it to the patient and only turn on during ischemia. And give it in a tissue-specific fashion. So that's the approach that we use. So our approach would be to think about using, for example, in this case, hemoxygenase 1. As you know, there are three isoforms. Hemoxygenase breaks down heme into uh, bilirubin, iron, and also carbon monoxide. It's been shown that many of these products are cell protective and vasodilatory. In so doing, we, can, we actually constructed uh, with hypoxic regulated elements, which is uh, from erythropoietin gene. So this uh, regulated promoter consists of hypoxic responsive element. The four tandem repeats will turn on this gene when it senses hypoxia, and we in this animal study, we gave it nine weeks ahead of time by giving it to the area at risk, thinking that if we're going to ligate that left artery, left anterior descending artery, this is the area at risk. So nine, days prior, nine weeks prior to the ischemic injury, we gave this gene product, uh, this uh, transgene, and then waited for nine weeks later for stable integration, then we induced ischemia and asked the question, can we actually turn this gene on? What you see here is uh, the gene product, which is protein. Now, and everybody has, have, has endogenous HO1. It can be turned on. And in fact, response to myocardial ischemia, HO1 is turned on, but it's turned on mainly driven by cytokines and inflammation. So you can see that when HO1 is turned on, it's outside the window of opportunity. And what we did fundamentally in the transgene is to allow the ischemic injury to turn on the gene right away. In this case, we use human x one You can see the protein product is being made and is, in fact, reached therapeutic levels within the time frame. So what we really are seeing is that if one were to administer this to an experimental animal preemptively before ischemia, the gene is silent, and during ischemia, the gene is turned on, and you use cell-specific, it will be in mouse sites, and then it protects the myocardium until you have time for reperfusion. And upon reperfusion, the genes turn off. So that's a very simple concept that we've been able to prove. What we're able to show is infarct size is greatly reduced by this approach. As is fibrosis, you can see that, in fact, using leg Z, you have lots of fibrosis, but here the myocardium is sufficiently protected. 
So we've uh, published quite a few papers on this, looking at uh, uh, the, as a preemptive strategy. In fact, I want to recognize Luz Milo, who's, a, who's really a brilliant student who came to work with me from Queen's University. And he went back to Queen's University as a Canadian research chair. Unfortunately, Lewis passed away from uh, pancreatic cancer a few years ago, and we now have a memorial lecture in his name. Lewis also went on to look at, with me, the idea of recurrent ischemic episodes. So the question is, not once, but create an experimental model that we can turn on and off, on and off multiple times. And when you do that, actually, multiple ischemic episodes lead to ischemic cardiomyopathy, so that the, the heart dilates and goes to the heart failure. And having HO1 as gene therapy prevented this from happening. And consequently, we're able to demonstrate that animals which receive HO1 therapy have a much improved survival, uh, as you can see, up to 12 months of measurements compared to, to Lex-Z control. So I merely want to introduce this as an example of translational research that is taking uh, what we understand as a fundamental pathophysiologic concept, trying to take in the biologic principles and the availability of viral vector, and, uh, and uh, really, in many ways, try to prove as a proof of concept whether this can go forward or not. The idea is to prior delivery of an inducible vector leads to a very low level of expression therapeutic gene by turn on by ischemia and then turns off a poor removal of, of the stimuli. And importantly, the expression, the rapid expression of the transgene gives you a therapeutic level to protect the target organ. So we hypothesize that this may be a very useful way to take patients who have high risk, that is patients who are coming to the uh, cath lab for elective uh, PCI, uh, elective angioplasty, and or stenting. They're the ones that are likely to have subsequent ischemic episode, or they come in for coronary artery bypass, and administer this as a way to see whether you can protect these patients from subsequent ischemic ischemia. Where we are right now is that we have now done large animal study, which have validated our approach, and looks uh, extremely encouraging. We have used a GMP-grade AAV9 using NIH vector core. We're now in the process of doing pharmacology toxicology and following a pre-IND. Now, this is, in fact, probably the second or third time I've taken a fundamental concept towards human. Now, whether I'll succeed or not, I don't know. And I know that the pathway going forward could be quite challenging. But nevertheless, I just want to illustrate this as an example of how one can take fundamental concepts and apply it to the bedside uh, of being a physician and physician scientist. Now, let's take this case. If you remember this patient, she was doing okay after the MI, but in three and a half years later, she came back and actually presented with heart failure with a dilated uh, uh, heart, and she was listed for cardiac transplantation. So the issue is the second challenge that we see in patients with ischemic heart disease. That is to say that when you do have acute MI, you have mouse eye death, inflammation, uh, inadequate angiogenesis, a lot of fibrosis remodeling, but importantly, limited ability of a mammalian myocardium, particularly human myocardium, to repair and regenerate, whereby, in fact, the myocardium, the, the myocardium goes progressive remodeling, result eventually in loss of contractile fashion and heart failure. Now, so this has been a dogma. When I was in medical school, it was taught, not by Peter, uh, that in fact, the heart has no way to regenerate itself. Uh, what the mouse sites are post-mitotic, or terminally differentiated. It wasn't not that long ago, only about the last seven to eight years, when this whole paradigm was being challenged by more careful work. But I thought the most interesting work was in this uh, paper published in Science by the Karolinska Institute Scientists that look at human myocardium and show evidence that actually human mouse sites can renew itself and proliferate, albeit insufficient. And this very cute experiment they did is to actually look at uh, autopsy specimens, looking at the heart in people before and after the nuclear bomb test during Cold War, because C14 was in fact being emitted. And C14 gets incorporated in your DNA. So you can actually look at the age of your mouse site. And so looking at before and after Cold War, those without and those with with, 
what they're able to show is in fact that myocardium in human is able to actually develop new mouse sites. It's doing at about 1% per year, but if you do that rate, actually a lot of myocardium, a good part of it will be regenerated over your lifetime. And that as you age, the, the, recurrent, the renewal rate uh, drops as uh, not too surprisingly probably related to shortening of telomere, et cetera. But nevertheless, this very important paper tells that it is possible to regenerate myocardium and there is repair mechanism, albeit insufficient uh, clinically. So this um, raises a lot of questions about what are the mechanisms for repair and regeneration and are there in fact opportunities to enhance this endogenous mechanism whereby you can actually uh, end up helping therapeutically. And currently there are a number of hypotheses and I think all of these are probably true uh, to a varying degree. One is that the mouse site itself can divide and re-enter into cell cycle. Second is that there are cardiac progenitor cells in the myocardium which are resident, small number that can get activated and they begin to proliferate and differentiate. Third is that there are extra cardiac sources like the bone marrow which harbors hematopoietic stem cells and mesenchymal stem cells and others that may be chemo-attracted to the ischemic tissue and then populated and then undergo transdifferentiation to form mouse sites. Uh, this has increasingly fallen out of favor, although there's still evidence suggestive of this. Most people believe that perhaps the mechanism resides within the myocardium itself, as I said, albeit insufficient. So with the work done by many investigators, uh, this is a summary article by Stephanie Demler. It is clear that one, there are in fact mouse sites, uh, cardiac progenitor cells within the myocardium, which actually interestingly are, act are present in, to a large extent in the cardiac atrium. And they are these cells which can then activate it and then get chemo attracted to ischemic area for, uh, for um, activation and differentiation. In addition to that, they're circulating blood cells, which are endothelial progenitor cells that probably originated from the bone marrow itself. Bone marrow is able to put in mesenchymal cells and hematopoietic stem cells and side population cells. Certainly, skeletal muscle of satellite cells, which are able to, in fact, form from these satellite cells to skeletal myocytes, sites, adipose tissues, and of course, embryonic cells. Now, needless to say, once you've got all these in vitro possibilities, which people have demonstrated, there's a flurry of data to say, can we use these cells for therapeutic purposes? Our experimental studies generally are very encouraging when it comes to this, but I think the challenge, of course, is, does this is this translatable to human? Um, here is the latest, um, as you can see, summary of clinical trials which in fact have randomized control approaches to study of the use of cell therapy for acute MI. Most of these are not stem cells really. They are using bone marrow cells. They call bone marrow stem cells, but they're mainly mononuclear cells from bone marrow, which a small fraction of it is in fact uh, stem cells. But what most of these investigators did is to in fact take the patients when they come with acute MI, harvest the bone marrow, usually through an aspiration, and then sort out the cells or enrich it with mononuclear cells and give it back to the patient several days later. So you can imagine, it's, not, it's a little clunky. It's not really that uh, user-friendly that you have to isolate the cells. But nevertheless, the trial was designed that way. As you can see, the number of subjects which are included in the study and the days after MI by which they have, were able to give the cells. To summarize the data, one can say the results have been modest at best. About 5 to 10% improvement in ejection fractions, so you read a lot about the hype of cell therapy, but it's really not there yet. But perhaps more importantly, it does have some evidence that in fact improved perfusion. But as I said, the most important thing is that it's safe and feasible. So this is a meta-analysis looking at all the trials which have been uh, carried out in a setting of acute MI. And you can see that this is, in fact, the bone marrow group. This is the control group. And if you look at the data overall, it's slightly in favor of bone marrow group, but really didn't reach much statistics. I think one could argue that this is safe. That's probably the most important thing we need to learn from this. 
So it's still very early days to say whether cell therapy, whether the right cells can really regenerate myocardium. But we do know that this is a safe approach and it's feasible. <coughs> Currently, there are a number of expanded trials that include the injection of bone marrow nuclear cells for long-term ischemic heart failure called FOCUS uh, HF, including 90 patients. Again, it shows improvement of symptoms, quality of life, but these are very soft endpoints. But most importantly, it's safe and it can be done. And you can see there's a proliferation of these trials now ongoing, uh, including some, in fact, carried out here by Duncan Stewart in Ottawa, et cetera. Uh, I want to call your attention to this study, which actually, unlike using bone marrow cells, use circulating actually mobilizes the bone marrow cells by using GCSF and, use, and isolated CD34 cells. So that's probably a be much better enriched. This study that by Douglas Soto has now gone past phase two and using patients with chronic angina ischemia demonstrated clear reduction in angina. So this is more of an angiogenic study rather than regeneration repair study, but I think it's uh, quite uh, encouraging. Um, a study in human compare the zancomal stem cell versus bone marrow cells is being carried out in Miami, still early. And finally, the most exciting study perhaps has just been published in Lancet by uh, Rebecca Boli in Louisville, where they enrolled 40 patients isolating, in fact, cardiac progenitor cells. These are C-kit cells obtained from patient samples and, in fact, isolated, cultured, and give it back to patients with heart failure. And their data so far early is quite encouraging, demonstrating an ejection fraction increase in the before and after in the ones treated with progenitor cells, uh, in fact, showing you, in fact, a wall motion score, reduction wall motion, and also a reduction in infarct size. So these are encouraging data, but still very early. So where are we going from here? Well, first of all, I think it's fair to say that if you look at clinical trials, the first generation of trials which I've reviewed with you have shown us some encouragement. Too much hype, not enough biology, but enough to say that it's safe and it's feasible. The real question is, what next? And you've already seen some early study on CPO trial, which uses uh, cardiac progenitor cells, and uh, Alcadia, which uses, in fact, uh, uh, cardiac spheres to get embryonic cells towards human, and uh, about the gravel stand using cell sheet technology. So this is the second generation. And as I'll discuss with you what's in the future, in fact, maybe other approaches altogether. So I think that to date, uh, this approach generally has been you know, very complicated and difficult because first of all, the amount of cells you need is very large because cells are generally not viable as we and others have shown when you put in the myocardium. Secondly, that you know, the whole issue of autologous for allogeneic, timing for administration, but I think uh, the most concern, of course, is that the outcome is really very, very modest. So NHLBI, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at NIH, has put through a number of major initiatives to say, let's reboot and look at what's in the future. And they put forward two major initiatives, one which is actually a $750 million initiative for a seven-year time span, supporting a whole number of hubs called the Cardiovascular Progenitor Cell Biology Consortium. I have the fortune of chairing the, both the steering committee and the scientific advisory board. Second is to create a network for clinical trials that involves multiple centers called the Cardiovascular Cell Therapy Research Network so that when, in fact, the cells are ready and some of the trials already showed you, which are supported by this network, are ready, that there's a network that can go forward uh, doing this research. And I chair the clinical protocol committee. Perhaps importantly is to say what's in the future. And that's why I want to spend the rest of my time talking about this. First of all, I show the slide simply to make sure that those in the audience who's interested in biomaterials and tissue engineering gets the recognition that this is a very important area. And I won't have time to talk about this. But perhaps more importantly, what I'd like to talk about is three areas, which is, is there an opportunity to genetically modify stem cells to enable them to do more 
than they are set to do that can enhance repair regeneration. Secondly is the observation that we and others have made that many of these cells release fact, biologically active factors that may themselves be therapeutic and be useful. And third is the very exciting work by Yamanaka and others of reprogramming, which I'll show you some data on direct reprogramming that reprogrammed from fibroblasts directly to mouse sites, bypassing all the need for cell therapy, et cetera. So you can see uh, our love in this area works data some time ago when we begin to speculate whether we can modify adult stem cells, which obviously have a lot of limitation, unlike embryonic stem cells. But can they be modified for myocardial repair regeneration? And the areas that we thought about would be, how will we enhance homing from, in fact, stem cells that you can put in the circulation where the homes to the area of ischemia? How about you enhance engraftment or survival, enhance differentiation, or help it release a lot more biologic substances, which are important for re repair and regeneration. Our, one of our earlier papers was, in fact, looking at uh, overexpressing AKT and mesenchymal stem cells that we removed, that we actually isolated from bone marrow in these uh, rats. And AKT, as you know, is a very important signal molecule that can increase cell survival, improve glucose metabolism, activates mTOR to increase protein synthesis, and release paracrine mediators. So consequently, what we did is fundamentally use either mesenchymal stem cells over stressing AKT or controlled like Z. And I guess you can easily see there's tremendous difference between AKT modified stem cells versus like Z in terms of dose dependent reduction in uh, infarct size and regeneration. The other approach we use is actually simply look at the genomic profile of the ischemia myocardium and looking at genes and gene products which are expressed on the mesenchymal stem cells and try to match them. What we observe is that mesenchymal stem cells from marrows do not express high levels of CCR1 or CCR2, whereas the ligands highly upregulate the ischemia myocardium. So what we decided to do is to overexpress CCR1 or CCR2 in these cells and then put them into the circulation and ask whether, in fact, they increase homing and therefore repair myocardium. What you see here are mouse sites which are labeled with GFP. And, uh, and interestingly, CCR1 overexpressing mouse sites uh, uh, of uh, MSCs uh, have much more homing and accumulation in the schema myocardium than control of CCR2. And importantly, you can see that, in fact, the infarct size is greatly reduced by the homing accumulation of these, mouse, of these uh, mesenchymal stem cells that presumably uh, differentiate into mouse sites. So the background thinking in this area is the ability to modify stem cells, adult stem cells they can obtain from different areas by actually modifying function, whereby you can improve the ultimately therapeutic outcome of this approach. As we're doing this work, uh, we begin to observe that using even our AKT cells, that in fact these cells are biologically active and they're releasing a lot of biologic material, which themselves may be very important in creating a microenvironment as the cells go to ischemic area, and the microenvironment is for repair and regeneration. So, for example, this is a, one of the work actually done by another very talented uh, Canadian who was a, uh, actually a cardiac surgical resident from Montreal Heart Institute. And Nicholas showed that when you put uh, mesenchymal stem cells into ischemic myocardium, and in this case, we track it with uh, GFP, as you can see, uh, about day seven, day 14, most of it are gone. And yet, what we managed to see is that there's a sustained improvement, in fact, a reduction in LV diastolic volume, and uh, a LV systolic volume increase, and also a reduction in the improvement ejection fraction. So this is certainly not consistent with the cells doing a regenerative work because they're gone. And yet we see long-term improvement. And this, in fact, has been, we went on to ask the question, why is that the case? And demonstrated that, in fact, these cells, when put into culture, 
release a lot of biologic substance that actually would do the job for repair and regeneration. So this data, which is also published a few years later, demonstrate that if you were to take cell culture from either um, mesangial stem cells treated with PBS, uh, cells, in fact, with the GFP, or cells overexpressing AKT, take the culture media and inject it right into ischemic myocardium. You can see that, in fact, the media released by the AKT MSCs actually mimic that of directly injecting MSCs, suggesting that they must be releasing paracrine substances. And in fact, since our work, many people have uh, uh, reported very similar observation. That is, uh, repair and regeneration, despite absence of long-term cells after its transplantation, and the evidence of release of paracrine factors. So we became interested in this whole idea of the paracrine hypothesis of stem cell action. Now, many of you who follow bone marrow work realize that we talk about the niche in the bone marrow, which is the microenvironment to support the stem cells for actual proliferation and uh, expansion. But in fact, to me, the niche also is what these cells reduce, release in terms of biologic substance that can create a microenvironment for itself as well and for adjacent cells to actually protect them and to undergo repair and regeneration. So our hypothesis argued that stem cells are able to release paracrine factors which can influence cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, smooth muscles, or fibroblasts, and even cardiac stem cells that can actually cause protection of ischemic myocytes, uh, improve cardiac metabolism, cause cardiac regeneration, remodeling, and, and revascularization and contractility. So we begin to ask this question in our research in our laboratory to understand these molecular pathways of the paracrine mechanisms and to look at what's their significance in vivo and whether, in fact, they become they're potentially therapeutic uh, for, for uh, in vivo as well. When we first started, we used a genomic approach, but we have also validated with a proteomic approach. Here we're looking at interrogating uh, genes which are differentially expressed in AKT MSC versus GFP in response to the hypoxia. And we found that, in fact, 60-some hundred genes were differentially regulated. But if you look at unique genes that encode for signal peptide, therefore secreted, they're about 50 at any one point. So with this kind of approach, we can begin to actually study what, in fact, are the potential biologic factors released by the stem cells that can be useful in myocardial one such factor is the secreted physio-related protein, SFRP2. As you know, there are currently five different classes of secreted physio-related proteins, uh, one to five, and uh, it actually and the antagonist of wind signaling. Now, wind, in fact, as you know, are agonists which can activate physio receptors on cells when it binds with L uh, LRP. And when physio receptors are activated, you can either activate a canonical or non-canonical pathway. Secreted physio proteins, uh, as you can see here, have the cysteine-rich domain, but do not have, in fact, transmembrane domain. So they're soluble proteins, and in so doing, they can bind with wind and become and sequester wind, so wind cannot activate its pathway, and therefore become antagonist of wind. And so the context is very important. You know, under what condition? What wind is actually released by what cells? And, and what is it doing, this specific wind for cell fate, is probably the whole area that we're working right now. To make a long story short, SFRP has four different actions that we have demonstrated. One is by binding WIN3A from release from fibroblasts and ischemic myocytes, it actually reduces cell death and uh, inhibits apoptosis. Uh, we have published this. Likewise, we published that, in fact, winds are very sticky proteins. So not only can they, pardon me, SFLP is a very sticky protein. Not only can they bind wind, they can also bind BMP1. And we have published in PNAS that binding PMP1 reduces the, the uh, collagen maturation and reduces, in fact, fibrosis. And furthermore, and both of these are through canonical pathways. Furthermore, it can induce angiogenesis by non-canonical pathway and then enhance regeneration of cardioprogenitor cells. So I'll show you some quick data. So this is, in fact, looking at AKT-MSC 
and AKTMSCs in which SFLP2 is knocked down by RNAi. And then we take these cells and put it back in the myocardium. You can see AKTMSCs greatly reduce infarct size and cause cardiac repair. But when you knock down SFLP2, a lot of effect is attenuated. Furthermore, if we were to inject SFLP2 into an infarct uh, animal, you can see fibrosis is greatly inhibited, and we've demonstrated the fundamental biochemical mechanism by which that works. And also, interestingly, SFLP can induce differentiation. So here you can see taking cardiac progenitor cells and incubating in presence of SFLP, NKX2.5 transcription factor for cardiac differentiation is up, and in fact, you can see the number of troponin I cells uh, increase in this population. So I think that what our hypothesis is that in, in situ, in vivo, there's a temporal and spatial regulation that whereas during the time of ischemia, you have cell death inflammation. And over time, in fact, different cells come in, and in so doing, they release different paracrine substances which in fact will have a temporal sequence in, uh, in cell repair and regeneration. In the case of FR2, it probably rapidly inhibits ischemic apoptosis. And then it reduces fibrosis, whereby it reduces remodeling. And then it enhances regeneration through the activation of cardiac progenitor cells. This is still very much hypothesis uh, in, in the works, but we have already moved on to large animal study asking whether SFLP can be useful in looking at reduction in infarct size and improvement in cardiac function. You can see in early data that, in fact, it's very encouraging. Using this approach, we also identify a whole number of new cytokines, which I won't have time to talk to you about, except that this hypoxic activated stem cell factor is really interesting because it uniquely uh, activates PKC epsilon, which, as you know, is a very important pathway for uh, cell preconditioning and protection of, uh, from cell death. So I want to finish my talk by saying, what else can one think about in terms of the um, programming or reprogramming of stem cells? So first, I told you that you can, re you can program the stem cells by simply overexpressing different genes. We have reported nitric oxide synthase, uh, cyclic GMP. In fact, that Duncan Stewart is using a NO overexpressed endothelial cells now for human uh, trials. Um, also, one can also manipulate pathways within these adult stem cells, whether using microRNA, siRNA, to look at how you can manipulate this uh, towards, in fact, getting the desired effect you want. And of course, there's also evidence that you can precondition them by taking the small paracrine factors I've shown you. People have shown that the IGF-1, when given to stem cells, these cells, are, when they pre incubate IGF-1, they actually have a lot more activation towards migration and proliferation as well. So there's a whole series of possibility in research. But reprogramming is even more interesting in programming because Yamanaka and others show that you can take an adult somatic cell, in this case, a human fibroblast, and by introducing four and then maybe three transcription factors, those factors which in fact have been known to keep stem cells in an undifferentiated state. By giving it to a somatic cell, it actually creates a cell that looks like a stem cell. It's called inducible pluripotent stem cells. This approach is very important because you can imagine now we can potentially get away from using human embryonic stem cells. Although a lot of work now, tons of work looking at mechanism and really how, dif how differentiate or how undifferentiated are these cells and how much they really capture embryonic stem cells. But once you, people have shown that once you get the IPS, you can actually drive it down the cardiac differentiation pathway and then give it back to the ischemic myocardium to show they can improve uh, you know, cardiac repair and regeneration. I think the most exciting work that followed this is Doug Melton's work a few years later where he showed that you can directly program an adult somatic cell to another adult somatic cell. And he argues that this bypasses the need to recapture all the way to IPS by looking at mesodermal markers and pluripotent cell markers that, in fact, you can directly reprogram and pancreatic exocrine cells 
to beta cells. That obviously activated our great interest to ask the question, if I was dealing with a patient with an infarct and there's fibrosis, can I actually direct reprogram a fibroblast to mouse site, whereby I don't have to worry about cell-based therapy, I can directly convert a fibrotic myocardium towards a contractile myocardium. So we started working with a student on this about three years ago, and just a few months ago, not a group by Deepak uh, Sirisvesta in uh, UCSF have reported this as a possibility. And what they did is they used uh, three transcription factors, which are known to be important in uh, cardiac differentiation. Our approach is different, and I'm going to show you our data to date. It's been submitted for publication. We use microRNA because we figure microRNA, as you know, uh, masters switches and regulators of gene expression. It's much easier to give, and perhaps we can be able to, rather than using transcription factor, we use microRNA. So we use a combination of microRNA, transiently transfected in cardiac fibroblasts, and assayed it initially looking at immunostaining, RT-PCR, then we've gone on to look at whether, in fact, there is a calcium channel activation, action potential, and contractility, and I'll show you some data still early in vivo as well. Here's a heat map to look at expression of uh, fibroblast gene profile and also of cardiomyocyte profile. You can see with the pr right combination, this shift from fibroblast to cardiomyocyte gene expression. And in fact, we've been able to demonstrate this in repeated fashion uh, using a number of different approaches. In this particular approach, we use a, um, a fibroblast, which in fact have uh, tomato expression. And uh, after transfection with the microRNA, you can see that it, in fact, this tracks because it uses a fibroblast specific promoter. And so it continues to show a linear tracing from its origin but now it's expressing sarcomeric protein, in this case, uh, myosin, or, uh, and you can see that, in fact, you can merge the, the image. So we can actually directly program a fibroblast to cardiomyocyte. Here you can see there's, in fact, uh, activation of uh, calcium uh, transients. If you look at this action potential, you realize that this is not quite a mature myocyte. So much of the issue is looking at how do you improve efficiency and how do you actually, when you reprogram this, to move it towards a more mature cardiomyocyte. Importantly, we've been able to do this in vivo. In other words, taking an animal doing lineage tracing, taking a mice with a fibroblast-specific promoter, although this is not really very specific, using a Cree tomato, we can actually look at any cell that's derived from fibroblast lineage by having, in fact, tomato. And by injecting microRNA, in fact, around the infarct area, we can show that, in fact, there is mouse sites generation shown, in fact, in troponin I staining in green. And when you match these two, you can see that in, there's evidence for, in fact, cells which are derived from fibroblasts altogether. So I think what I've been able to show in this short time is that reprogramming may be a very, very important direction. So let's come back to five years from now, here in St. Paul's Hospital. If such a patient came out again, came uh, you know, with the acute MI, what would happen? Aside from that, the ability to use cardiac MRI and quickly intervene, now you have the ability to harvest stem cells and maybe locally inject them. And I think over beyond 2017, maybe the use of microRNA and paracrine molecules so that as a patient leaves hospital, there's, in fact, a good uh, maintenance of cardiac function given the whole bunch of discharge meds. And over time, there's repair and regeneration, whereby MRI shows this patient is now back to almost normal with a small MI. And importantly, this individual is going to be symptomatically active and just come and help you raise money for cardiovascular <laughs> research. So I hope that what I've been able to show you is, uh, you know, really two important potential therapeutic areas than which translation research can be helpful. One is a preemptive gene therapy to given to high-risk patients in which the myocardium can be protected during ischemia, enough time for reperfusion to occur, and therefore greatly reducing the, the uh, size of the infarct. 
And secondly, if one were to have, in fact, uh, you know, a large amount of injury, the use of cell or molecular-based therapy to repair regenerative myocardium. So I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, this is, in fact, the work, of course, is always done by many, many postdoc students and colleagues. And uh, I'm very grateful to them. So thank you. used up some of the front end time. We need to have the opportunity for some questions uh, from the audience. Dr. When, you, uh, when you put the genes in for preemptive therapy, what cells do they usually go into? Do they go into myocardial cells always, or do they go into a variety of cells? Yeah, are you talking about the microRNA work? Yeah. Or no, the, the, the very first work when you're... Ah, right. Yeah, so uh, what I failed to, sh to discuss is actually the use of cell-specific promoters. So they may go into different cells, but they only turn on in bio, bio sites. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, you asked the two most important questions, which is being debated, you know, because it's still early. We don't have data yet. I would say the question about first one, it is, uh, you know, in fact, when they become cardiomyocytes, are they sustained? Uh, most of our work have done in vitro, which observed the cells up to about four weeks, and uh, we have not gone beyond that. So your question is well taken. And in fact, the efficiency is not very high. <coughs> we use a jack... Jack one inhibitor, and that can bring it up about 10, 20%. But most people are seeing about 5% or less, so it's not quite there yet. Um, what's interesting is that uh, if you follow the area, <coughs> the leaders of research are Deepak and also Eric Olson. And both of them are claiming that using transcription factors, using a viral vector, what they're able to show is, in fact, significant improvement in cardiac function over time. We have not been able to follow that as yet. So that would suggest that, well, first using a viral vector, uh, you know, uh, and particularly when they use lentivirus or retrovirus, they're able to get long-term expression of these transcription factors. So the real question is going to be, how do you make sure that, in fact, that, in fact, the sustained expression of these factors, and once you switch them, once you switch them, would they not switch back and become mouse sites? Those are work in progress. Exceedingly interesting, and you've shown how you steadily make progress. So, Victor, how, how do you figure this area got into clinical trials so quickly? I mean, surgeons all over the world were injecting stem cells into hearts when they were operating at a time when there was no evidence that it would be of any use whatsoever. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I always joke about the uh, cowboy mentality of cardiologists, myself being one, you know? <laughs> when it's a good opportunity, you go ahead and do it. And sometimes it's proven to be very helpful. We, in fact, last night talked about whether the drug looting stand is any good over bare metal stand, and the fact the stand has made a huge difference. So um, I think that the cells, injecting cells into myocardium, to me, uh, is premature. And you need these kind of really controlled trials to show whether it's useful or not. And if all of us remember some of uh, Ron Yee's work looking at, you know, taking uh, what appears to be mouse sites to be re-injected into, uh, you know, animals and humans as well. And I think, I think what we clearly are saying is, given the cells we're given today, it's clearly not sufficient. It's got to be, as you saw those clinical trials, the next second or third generation before you actually see significant improvement. And so what is that is the question. And I just gave some examples of things that we can be doing in terms of better understanding biology or manipulating these cells in order to make them function even better. Dan over there. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, the review you gave of all the different cell types possibly involved as, as cardiac stem cells has expanded in recent years with uh, all sorts of different cells being either well, one or SCA1 or CKID or with 
um, parasites and whatnot. Do you think these are actually different cell types is the first part of the question. The second part would be, do you think if all these cell types are being tried, is that um, going to help sort of the progress of, of these for clinical translation and, and numerous sort of groups sort of trying different approaches? Or how, how do you think that will impact? So you talk about cardioprogenitive cells first, right? Your first question? Yeah. Yeah. So in cardioprogenitive cells, I think they are, that it's a mix possibility. In other words, as you know, some of these cells actually give you specification. So clearly that they tell you whether become atrial or ventricular mouse sites, right? So I, I believe there's probably a, a kind of a real stem cell that goes down and begins to split into different lineages. And so when people are looking at all these different markers and separation, they could be looking at whole spectrum of both in terms of the, the development process as well as bifurcation in some of these uh, pathways. So, so I think right now it's not clear and still a lot of work needs to be done. I think the best insight would be to do developmental biology and study them rather than doing the way that we're doing at this point in time, just isolate them at different uh, stages. As far as the other cell type, you know, their claims about mesenchymal stem cells and other cell types become cardiomyocytes, I think many of these are more of in vitro phenomenon than probably in vivo phenomenon. I think reprogramming, on the other hand, is quite exciting. And the question earlier is that when you reprogram these cells, do they, first of all, if you reprogram an, a somatic cell to a stem cell like inducible IP, IPS, do they, are they really, really, do they have to program that of an embryonic stem cell? I, and as you know, they don't quite capture this. I mean, the epigenetic abnormalities, et cetera, that's not quite there yet. Nevertheless, I think most data would suggest they're at least capable of driving down to differentiate different cells. And most of the data to date, when you try to take an embryonic stem cells or IPS towards cardiomyocytes in vitro, the cells are not fully mature. Now, something happens in vivo, hopefully, that may be, you know, connection, maybe mechanical forces that, that drive the cells to maturation. But in vitro, most of the time, you don't get full maturation. Can I add one more, actually? Yeah. Um, just on top of the, the in vivo re reprogramming data that you had, have you guys found there's obviously beneficial effects to generating cardiomyocytes. Is there any negative consequences to losing those cardiofibroblasts? Is there any evidence of that? Uh, so <laughs> you have some very important questions. In fact, you know, <laughs> people have gone on argue this for a long time, whether in fact converting a scar, removing a scar is a good thing or not. Because af after all, there's a reason to have a scar that may, you know, give the myocardium some serious protection from stretch and rupture, right? So until this is done, I, I won't know the answer, but certainly it would be very important to ask the question. Now, the, uh, the idea behind this is that you're not taking away the scar. In fact, you are converting them into a cell that has contractile probabilities. So maybe not, but it still remains to be, seen, to be proven. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Right. Um, the fact that some of these stem cells can produce paracrine factors that have an effect on, on the heart, uh, why couldn't they have an endocrine effect? So couldn't the, you have stem cells under the skin somewhere that are expressing some of these beneficial genes and yes. having a distant effect, or do they have to be, do they have to home to the heart? Not at all. I think they have endocrine effect. They have autocrine effect. And I use as paracrine mainly because I think about uh, as a, a kind of a, in a local concentration because whatever you release, first of all, it obviously influences your immediate surroundings. So autocrine, paracrine. But there's no question that they can spill into systemic circulation depending on how low, high the level is. So is that not, not a therapeutic option? Then? Uh, than, Yes, you mean, you mean using stem cells as an endocrine organ to release factors. Uh, absolutely. I think the question always is, do you get the right concentration in the right place? And, you know, and if you were to have endocrine effect, it's like getting a certain blood level. Do you get untoward effect elsewhere as well? But no question about that, yeah. Well, I think that the questions have been asked. It's uh, an opportunity to express personal thanks for a brilliant presentation. Thank you. Uh, and uh, you epitomized the Friesen Prize superbly. For those of you who missed some of the uh, slides here, if you go online and look at the, uh, 
Dr. Zhao's presentation in Ottawa, you'll uh, discover more of the uh, information now we've advanced a, a bit. But I'd like to express thanks and appreciation Thank to you, Peter, for this wonderful, wonderful talk on uh, cardiac regeneration recovery and uh, stem cell science. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.